Well, how's it going? If it, uh, it feels like we have been planning this thing uh, for for what seems to be forever, you know. Um, but I'm really excited for you to finally be on the podcast, and so we can dive into you know your experience and what you're doing now. Thank you very much for having me, Joe. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, you know, it's interesting. I have done about 150 of these episodes and I always start people off with their background. And I, I literally haven't heard the same background twice. Uh, that, that includes interviewing other people from the 8200 group. You know, they all specialize in different things. Like I talked to someone that reverse engineered malware, you know, and this guy was talking like skies above my head, you know, it was hard to understand. Um, so how, how did you get into it? You know, did you, were you younger with an incline towards it, towards computers, or was it kind of, you know, just where you placed? <laughs> that's a, that's a, a good one. So, I joined the IDF after studying electric, electrical engineering. And uh, it was the late 90s, back then. Uh, and I joined the, the technological uh, area of the Unit 8200, which is the equivalent of the famous NSA. And um, very quickly, I mean, within a year or two, we discovered the opportunity that there is in the uh, HTTP uh, protocols over the signals that we can intercept. And one thing led to the other. And... Uh, I think that uh, I, I love opportunities. I'm very curious. I want to check things. And uh, and since the, the potential was so huge, uh, I was uh, very fortunate to be in the very, very, very early, very early stages of uh, Discovering those protocols, what's going on there, what can you do with it. Uh, grew up to develop tools to manage uh, development teams, research teams. Then uh, moved on to operations. Uh, I grew old. The management uh, got wider bigger teams, uh, more responsibilities, some uh, new aspects of uh, cyber. You know, cyber has many aspects, but uh, uh, I was uh, testing uh, technology from uh, uh, many aspects. And then I was very fortunate to join the JCDD, which is the Cyber Defense Division of the IDF. So I was in charge of an operation uh, center uh, that was uh, actually in charge of the strategy of how to uh, protect such a huge and complicated organization. Uh, retired as a colonel and thought, uh, okay, I had such a wonderful career. What am I going to do tomorrow? And then, since uh, you remember I told you I love the opportunities, I saw the amazing adoption of SaaS applications by uh, companies. I didn't see that uh, back then when I was in the IDF because the IDF is, uh, is a very secure organization, uh, air-gapped, of course. And once I saw all this goodness that there is out there with companies that need to move fast and want to move fast and uh, usage of so many different applications in such an easy, affordable, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, rich uh, way, uh, but with the lack of tools to discover, to control, to help you make a decision of whether it's risky, is it allowed, does it fit the policy of the organization? So I understood that there is a huge gap there. And uh, that's uh, how uh, we established Wing. Hmm. So, yeah, my background is mainly security, huh. cyber. That's, uh, you know, it's, it's really fascinating. Do you ever look back at, you know, the years that you spent getting into cyber and think like, man, I was at the beginning of this thing called cybersecurity. Like it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even a term back then, right? Like no one even thought uh, that computers could be used, you know, so maliciously, right? Like now we're seeing, you know, nation state actors hacking other countries, uh, taking over, you know, uh, critical services and critical infrastructure and whatnot. Like that wasn't even... I mean, that was science fiction. That was considered to be a science fiction movie, right? Did you look, yeah. do you ever look back and think like, man, I was at the beginning, like how immature were we to think that this wasn't going to go anywhere? Yeah. I was actually writing some of those chapters. It's, hmm. <laughs> I was very fortunate to be uh, at the right place uh, at the right time. So I can tell you that each time, each, each new chapter was so thrilling that, uh, yeah, it was a very uh, excited, uh, exciting period. Uh, yeah, it's it where I am today, you know, thinking uh, as an attacker always helps you uh, understand as a, uh, as a defender, uh, as a... In, in charge of protection and uh, security helps you uh, focus on the on the right things or uh, building the strategy how do you want to approach this uh, you know the, this whole problem because as an attacker you always need uh, you know one window open but as a defender, you need to make sure that all the doors and all the windows are locked. So it's it's much more difficult. You need strategy. You need to, a method. You need, of course, tools. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, when uh, so I got my master's in cybersecurity and, you know, along the path, right, you, you take a red teaming class and then you take a blue teaming class. And you didn't think about the order of it or anything you know you're told to take it one semester you take it right it's a very hands-on program so you know you're you're actually you're learning you know through a slide of okay this is how i can do reconnaissance on a windows server this is what it looks like and then you're actually doing it you know in a lab like you're actually typing the commands and everything and i didn't think the importance of it until i got to the blue team class and they said, okay, you know, your final project is to protect this environment against the red team class. And, you know, if no one gets into your sector, you get an A, right? And if someone gets in, but they can't get very far, it's a B. If they can get the secret, it's an F. Like, there's like no in between on it, you know? And yeah. um, that was extremely interesting because, you know, everyone in the program went red team first, you know? So to see to see like just what what we were doing how we were attacking the problems first and prioritizing it um you know i think we had like 24 hours to like secure our secure our network you know and it, it was really it was fascinating but you don't realize it until you go through the red team side and it's like oh okay like i'm used to thinking that other way Th this is what i would do if i was trying to get in right Right. I think it's uh, very beneficial. Hmm. Yeah. It, it's all, it's all about a mindset too. When I have like red teamers on, it, re it really is all about a mindset of thinking, oh, okay, that didn't work. 
let's try this other thing over here. Is that uh, is that something that is taught, um, you know, in the eighty two hundred group, or is that something that's kind of just like you you grow to have it, right? Like it's not something that's taught or mentioned or anything like that, but it's something that it's like a it's an attribute that you grow to to have. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I think uh, you know it's like. Uh tackling uh, uh, complicated problems. So you try one thing and if it doesn't work, then you don't give up, right? You mm. you have a mission, you can't uh, not solve it. So you try one thing and if it doesn't work, then you try another thing. And if the, the, that doesn't work, then you try another thing and then you, you make it. I don't know any other way. I mean... Mm. In many cases, uh, it's not the first thing that works, but you learn a lot and uh, you develop, you evolve and you get better and uh, you understand the, you, you find your way. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I asked that question, right? Because I know that there's going to be someone out there that's trying to get into cybersecurity and I, I get this question a lot, like how how can I get into cybersecurity without failing? <laughs> you know, and it's like a it's an impossible task. You wouldn't want the end result of that. You would want to fail as much as possible. You know, in the beginning of my career, before I was even in cybersecurity, you know, there was a couple situations where I like completely destroyed a customer's database, and we had to restore it from like the Postgres you know, edit logs, right? The, the the user logs to get the data back, right? And I, I it was twofold. I learned what not to do. And then I learned a really interesting way of how to recover someone's data <laughs> if I really messed it up. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's uh, looking back on it, it's really helpful, right? And I've used that maybe once or twice since. But it was right. really helpful to just experience that because it's like, Oh, I'm getting fired today. I didn't realize that. And then, you know, my VP is like, uh, no, you better fix it. Like, we need you to fix it. Of course. I think that, you know, we learn uh, more, of course, from our uh, complicated situation. Uh, and uh, since uh, the real world uh, is the. Uh, complicated enough to provide enough opportunities to learn then uh, each of us in the uh, I think in almost everything we do we need to cope with the situations that are not easy and security teams are uh, at the front line because uh, it's not something rare uh, that uh, you need to deal with the security situation. Uh, and since the, the world is getting more and more and more complicated and security teams need to uh, have, uh, you know, they need to be all around players, right? They, they have the, the users and their endpoints and those users now they use so many SaaS applications and now they need to cover different aspects uh, of the organization but still uh, not be in the no-no uh, position, then uh, this is very challenging. And that's why I think that uh, solu the solutions that we also see in the, in the domain evolved. And we see uh, more and more solutions, spe specifically in the, the, in the complicated uh, domain of uh, security and specifically in the SaaS security, uh, that try to, to push you towards understanding, assessing, right? You need to cover so collect enough information so you will have the ability to make decisions and then focus on the major ones. Of course, there are always priorities, so you need to focus on the major ones. 
And then, you know, uh, the, the better the solution, the, the simpler or maybe the, the opportunity to solve uh, those uh, uh, situations in a fast and easy way uh, to help you move on to the next thing. But from any uh, incident like this, you learn, you you investigate, you learn, you know for the next time how to react. Yeah. Uh, that's the story of our lives, right? Right. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, you, you talk about SaaS applications uh, kind of, kind of being the new frontline almost, right? Is that a change or a shift that you saw, you know, potentially in the 8200 group where you were looking more at SaaS applications than other areas or other attack paths um, where you got the idea for wing security? Um, because at least from my end, right, the defender side um, in cloud security, like, SaaS applications are the things that frustrate me the most, right? Because anyone with a credit card can not only just start up a cloud account, they can start up a SaaS, you know, uh, application account and start putting my data or the company's data into this okay. application that may not be secured the way that we need it to be secured. And now we're in a situation that we didn't intend to be in, we didn't expect to be in, that we didn't even know we were in. Is that an attack path that you saw develop potentially? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that uh, this is the, the vector uh, that uh, we already see and we will see more and more in the future. Uh, applications, SaaS applications uh, are the new way no it's not new in terms of uh, you know this year but uh, we see this market growing in a fast pace uh, uh, last i heard uh, 18% per year so it's a uh, i don't know a 200 billion uh, dollar uh, market growing in a fast pace so we understand that the, it's dynamic it's growing Everyone can use it, just as you said. And uh, we see that there are two uh, potential, uh, okay, there are many, but uh, in, the, uh, in the examples that uh, you took us there, there are two things that we will uh, see. One of them is the, uh, uh, you know, applications that are not naive. Rogue, rogue uh, applications. Uh, you know that uh, there are about 50 applications that are uh, disguised or close uh, or pretend to be uh, chat GPT like with a very similar name, with a very similar logo. So there are about 50 applications that are a uh, Gen AI solution, not the OpenAI original uh, ChatGPT. And now that people in the organization upload their data, maybe code, maybe uh, information related to customers, now this uh, data resides somewhere in this app. And... Uh, who who is doing the process of making sure that this app is uh, safe enough to hold the company's uh, information so that's one thing and the other thing is uh, since the domain is so active applications are being bre breached and um we have visibility to hundreds hundreds of companies 84 of the companies that we see we're using, on average, three and a half applications that been, that's been breached in the last three months. So since we're, we're talking about big numbers, uh, organizations with hundreds of employees, 200, 300, 500 use 
nearly 1,000 applications, okay? 800, 900 applications. With that number, of course, some of them may be risky. Some of them may, uh, uh, may be breached. So th that's, that's absolutely the new attack surface. And we see this phenomenon phenomena growing. Uh, both, you know, by attackers to uh, uh, to use the, the the potential that they have now, uh, and I I believe that we will see this uh, growing, uh, you know, in twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five, and so on. Maybe it's the 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 new uh, channel for fishing. Hmm. That way. It's an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, you know, when you heard about the Microsoft Outlook breach, um, to me, that sounds like a SaaS breach. And, you know, they, they denied that there was any data breach, that people just took over email accounts and whatnot. But that doesn't... It doesn't make sense to me being a defensive person, right? Because if you take over someone's email account, you have their data. Like you, you, a hundred percent, you have their emails and whatnot, right? Um, but the way that these attackers seem to have done it seems to be a bit more, um, I, I guess, you know, it was precise in the accounts that they intentionally took over. But the way that they did it basically could have impacted anyone on that platform. You know, um, what was your thoughts when you saw the breach from Microsoft? Uh, well, uh, look, Joe, uh, I'm not surprised because we, uh, we cover... Uh, as a core business of uh, of Wing, since we are SaaS experts, we uh, we've built a huge database of SaaS applications, more than two hundred and eighty thousand SaaS applications covered in the database. We collect information about applications, the vendors, all the time, and part of it. Uh, are uh, vulnerabilities, breaches, uh, any information that can add uh, to the security assessment of the application and the vendor. So we will be able to provide our customers with the uh, insights uh, on their application, on their SaaS application usage, and where and to focus them on their major risks. So we see applications being breached all the time. Those applications are connected by the employees in the company. It's, it's what they do all the time. Outlook is a major application, major one. I mean, in like a, who doesn't in a use it? If, yeah, if that's the email platform, everyone in the organization will use it. But, uh, you know, since we talk about big numbers, hundreds of applications being used in a, in a company, it's not only those big applications that everyone is aware of and everyone is using, but also the applications that are used by a small number of uh, employees or the applications that are connected to your internal assets. Think of the third-party applications that are connected to your maybe Outlook or to your Slack or to your Salesforce. And that's one of the major challenges of uh, uh, protecting the SaaS domain, the usage, the safe usage of uh, SaaS uh, applications. So I was not surprised. We see that uh, uh, all the time. And as I mentioned, the statistics uh, also support it. Uh, that's why security teams need to have a tool that will help them cover this uh, new attack surface 
uh, all the time. So you have the list of all your applications. You have you you know all the applications that are being used by your employees, and this is your attack surface. The the very 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 basic thing is to know. Then you can uh, respond if you know that one of the applications that is being used by your employees is, has been breached. You can assess what is the risk, what data was shared on, over this app, what permissions uh, did this uh, application get to your internal assets and respond, of course. Maybe remove the permissions, maybe uh, block the usage, maybe change the credentials. But yeah, first of all, you have to know that you can respond. Hmm. So that that's interesting. You know, I, like you said, the first step is to, you know, see what is out there, what's being used. So how does your solution do that? Do you, you know, look for key identifiers of the company within these SaaS applications through your integrations and say, you know, if something matches, I don't know, the company's name or the company's IP or something like that, then we'll list it and categorize it uh, and go go about it like that. Or how do you how do you create that list? That's that's probably actually the hardest part for me personally, right? Is is actually creating that list of even just knowing what's out there. You're not the only one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, it's uh, it's a very common problem. And uh, uh, you are right. It's uh, it's not easy to do. And uh, I would even say that it is impossible to do in a manual way because it's changing all the time. All the time, all the time. Uh, applica- new applications are being used. Applications that have been used two months ago are not used anymore. And this is the one of the challenges in this domain that it's so dynamic and and so wide. So the way we do that, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, we have the uh, database of SaaS applications. It is extremely important because without that, discovering the applications that you use will be almost meaningless. It will be like a a flat data without uh, the means to do anything with it. Uh, think of a, a list of hundreds of applications. Of course, the major 50, you know. Maybe you heard of something from the next 50. But if you're a company with 600, 800 applications, it is almost meaningless to have this list of fascinating names without the context of what this app is about, who is the vendor, is it a big one, is it a small one, what are the compliances that this vendor... This is actually, since it's your attack surface, this is your way of assessing the third-party risk that you have uh, as a company. This is actually, you know, uh, part of the compliance that uh, each of the of the company it's the basic basic layer of uh, being secure just you know the the fundamentals of compliance are covered in the uh, discovery piece so how do we do that we connect through uh, OAuth through integration uh, to the applications that are being used by uh, by, by by the company. We collect the data about the users, the permissions, the applications, the roles of the of the users. All that data is aggregated into a very simple uh, list of assets, of SaaS assets. That is correlated to the information that we have about the vendor, about the breaches, the intelligence threats, everything is combined together. And that's your uh, list of applications. What did you not 
get through this approach. You did not get the, the applications that are accessed directly by the employees, not through the major uh, single sign-on or uh, the major uh, access uh, management. And uh, an application that I used with uh, the credit card, just as you mentioned, may not be discovered that way. So we have an additional capability to query the endpoints. It's not an agent, it's not persistent, but we query the endpoints and we collect the additional information that is missing through the first approach. And these are all aggregated into a unified uh, SaaS uh, asset management. And now you can manage it. Now that you have the list, I can tell you that 30% of the applications are, you know, they have access, but uh, they are not being used for weeks and months. So easily you can uh, make a decision to remove the permissions and to minimize your attack surface. Uh, we can help you uh, uh, see or uh, uh, focus on the applications that are not uh, following your security policy. Uh, and the nice thing that you may uh, find uh, uh, interesting and uh, maybe it will make you very happy is that you can do it uh, for free. You can access our website and we have a tool that helps mm. you with discovering and assisting the uh, applications uh, of your uh, of your company so you hmm. can do it uh, yeah super easily no uh, no human in touch just try it that's uh you know that's that's really interesting you bring up a situation kind of where you know employees going on their own to access these applications and potentially, you know, do it outside of like a company network. Right. Um, I, I think that that's what you were talking about. And to me, it feels like if it, if it gets that far, it's a breakdown in probably so many other controls that may not even exist, you know, like DLP, um, like in the cloud, for some reason, it, it feels like people just completely forgot that DLP is a thing almost. And, and um, it, it opens up the organization to a lot of different risks. Do you do you also do you also, you know, provide recommendations around that or, you know, what like, like in your report potentially like say like, hey, this like, yeah, we caught it, but this isn't you know, potentially like the, the primary, you know, source that you should be resolving, you should probably be looking at this, you know, other domain that you don't even have in the environment. Um, okay, so uh, there, there are uh, uh, many aspects of uh, the DLP uh, 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 challenge or problem. Uh, but uh, you're right. The major thing that we care about is the data of the company, right? That's the, the, the essence. That's what we want to, we want to look at the company's intellectual property. And of course, of course, we must protect the data of our customers. So uh, data leakage is... Uh, one of the greatest fears or one of the major things that as a security team uh, we want to protect. And the SAS uh, domain is challenging in that aspect as well because data is stored by users, by our employees on these applications. And not only that, employees, they, they want to work. They want to get their job done. They share that data with uh, sometimes other collaborators because uh, they, they need to do their job, right? Uh, they, they have a need, they, they need to do something, they share information. And uh, uh, you're right, it's a risk. So part of the, uh, of, of the solution 
for securing the SAS domain should uh, uh, provide discovery of the data that is stored on these applications. And since with huge numbers of you know lines of file names or uh, other types of data that are so you will not be able to do anything with it, then a good solution should focus you on the major risks. For example, uh, sensitive files that are shared and uh, maybe risky, so you don't want to share them with uh, external uh, collaborators or the way you share them is not the right way. Uh, or maybe uh, shared on uh, public Slack channels in an environment that uh, many external uh, guests have uh, access to. So a good SSPM solution should also provide insights about data and uh, the capability to minimize the attack surface in that aspect as well. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. Hmm. Yeah, it's... You know, that's the thing with this space, right? It's a it's a, like a ever growing and evolving space and it's only going to become a bigger issue. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's only going to become more important. And I you know, personally from being in cloud security, I I feel like cloud security will turn into it like its own security team in terms of having the different domains and different teams specializing in the different areas of the cloud um, and SaaS being one of them, you know, as soon as I hear SaaS, it's like, Oh no, <laughs> like, I don't think I want to know this information. Do we have to go over this? You know, like as soon as I hear that, because it, it opens up such a, a different can of worms. It's, it's not only not your computer that you're storing your data on. You also don't really have, the ability to determine the type um, of storage mechanism your data is on or the format that your data is in, right. right? To determine like, okay, if I decide to leave, I don't know, Microsoft for some reason, right? Can I even recover my data? I mean, who who knows, right? Like who, who else has, has done it with X solution, you know, whatever it might be, right? Um, do you also provide insights with your solution to say like, hey, your vendor lock-in with this SaaS application is a little bit higher than other applications? Or, you know, can I go to your solution and let's say I'm looking to use some SaaS application. Can I go to your service and have your service give me like a rundown on that SaaS application and say like, oh, it's it's okay to use or, you know, these are the things that you have to be thinking about and whatnot. Do you provide yes. that sort of guidance? Yes, absolutely. First of all, we provide you insights about the vendor. As I mentioned, uh, some uh, information business-wise, what this uh, app and vendor is all about, uh, you know, uh, the size of the company and so on, but also the compliances that this vendor uh, has and... Uh, uh, you know, with uh, a, a final risk scoring that is based on the uh, many attributes that Wing collects per vendor that are calculated into a security risk for you. Okay. So once you have uh, visibility about the applications that you use, you also have it embedded inside the uh, security risk uh, scoring that uh, Wing uh, gave to the vendors. But now let's assume that you want to check on a new app whether it's uh, safe enough, whether you want to uh, allow your employees to use it or not. We also have this um, uh, lookup in the, uh, this huge database that we have so our customers can also explore uh, and get information about applications that uh, they're not using. Uh, and we also provide some alternatives. So if you look at this app and you're interested in what are the other uh, 
solutions that uh, are in the same category or you can uh, you want to I don't know uh, compare to then uh, we also provide some alternatives uh, uh, for you so you can mm. see you know also the the other uh, security scoring that the alternatives uh, have. Yeah, it's an interesting area in the space that I feel is is often overlooked. You know, actually being able to do, you know, an assessment to some degree of a SaaS application, I, I feel like it's almost like uh, viewed as a closed off door. You know, like, yeah, it's there. You know, it's there yeah. and you can't go behind it, you know, for whatever reason, um, which, you know, opens up the organization to a lot of different risks that they normally wouldn't be in. Right. That that's you know uh, part of the reason why uh, uh, compliances, uh, you know, stock and ISO they ask for the third part, party risk assessment chapter. So they want you to list your vendors, and they ask you to collect enough uh, information to make sure that you know that you can trust those uh, vendors. And uh, since we don't want to make it a headache for you, uh, it may be a headache if you have to go over dozens of uh, vendors and try to collect uh, the data and assess yourself whether you can trust them or not, then having a tool that summarizes it all for you in one place and that you can also use that information as an evidence, as part of your uh, compliance procedure, is uh, is very beneficial. And one one last thing that I want to say is that I truly relate to the way you approach it. You don't want to get into something that will be more of a headache than of a solution. And I, I I couldn't agree more because we as security teams, we have already so much on our plate. We have so many things we need to take care of all the time. There are all, only more and more aspects of uh, cyber that are added and we, we're just uh, this... Uh, function that needs to make sure that the business can run as fast as possible towards being a successful business. And if you we'll find the right tools with the right approach to make sure that you can keep the SaaS usage uh, safe, but still without uh, an army of uh, 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 employees in your team that need to go over all these applications and make sure that all the permissions are right, blah, 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 then this is a good solution. So I advise all of the audience uh, that uh, uh, check for uh, solutions to the, to the SaaS domain to look for solutions that uh, automate the process, that make uh, sure that the load of work that is needed is uh, is something that uh, the, that you can do with your own team and not uh, I don't know add or uh, recruit uh, or increase your uh, team to support. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So you know we're we're unfortunately at the end of our time here. You know, before I let you go, why don't uh, why don't you tell my audience, you know, where they can find you, where they can find your company if they're interested in reaching out and and learning more. Um, and you know, before we dive into that, you know, I, I really enjoyed our conversation too. Like I, I thought that it was, it, it's always interesting, you know, talking to someone with your experience. You never really know um, what what you're going to get in terms of an interview, in terms of the the content of the interview. And, uh, it, you know, it was a fa fascinating conversation. I really appreciate you being on. Thank you very much, Joe. I, uh, I enjoyed it myself. It was amazing. And you can reach me at uh, galit at wing.security. And you can explore 
uh, our solution on our website, www.wing.security. And uh, we're, we're waiting for you. Come and explore. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode.